they they find um a bunch of burner cell phones they find like a bag of like fifty thousand dollars of cash they find a bunch of like the hardware wallets that had the bitcoins in them and then they found like folders on their computer that were like fake passport ideas and like <laughs> like places to go places to run away like they found like folders that said that shit on their computers I don't even entirely understand what happened, but I have a backstory well, about the read people. Today's edition of the Milk Road, you will get the full backstory in 10 bullet points. Yeah, um, you need to go earlier. So, so but, we, but we did bullet point it. And what, so here's what happened. 2016, this crypto exchange called Bitfinex got hacked. And at the time, I think like 120,000 Bitcoin got stolen. That was like $70 million got stolen. And it was like, it was bad. Uh, that was like a big hack. The price of Bitcoin that week dropped by 40%. So it was like a... It caused like this huge, uh, you know, like uh, a, a fear shock in the market. But the thing about Bitcoin is Bitcoin is on a public ledger, right? Like it's a, it's a public blockchain. So everybody could see the coins. So everybody saw, oh, the, the coins are in this wallet. <laughs> and like, and so all the other exchanges were like, look, this is bad for the industry. We will try to prevent, like if, if that wallet tries to cash this out, we won't let them cash out uh, the money. So for many years, that money kind of just sat in those wallets or was moving in like really small, small transactions back and forth between a, like a, a web of wallets. Clearly, somebody was trying to like launder the money. Essentially, they were trying. But but how, how did he how did they even get it um, in the first place? So there, I don't know. I don't know what the exploit was that let them hack the accounts. And they didn't hack all the accounts on Bitfinex. They actually just hacked like some of the whale accounts. So they were able to take 120,000 Bitcoin from not all the accounts. And the funny thing is... Bitfinex didn't have the money to like make those users whole. So what they did was they they reduced everybody on Bitfinex's balance by 33% or something to like balance it out. Something like, hor like imagine if your bank did that. That would be like insane. I'd be like, oh, they robbed that guy's vault and you're taking my money away to like even it out for everybody? Like, no, thank you. Um, so anyways, it was bad. And there's a reason why Bitfinex is not like, you know, the biggest exchange now. Um, so anyways, that the money kind of sat there. Now, fast forward, five and a half years go by. Last week, people start to notice bigger transactions coming from the uh, the Bitfinex hack wallets, um, and so they like there's these alerts on Twitter like whale alert, whale alerts like the coins are moving, the coins are moving, hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars of the coins are moving, ten million dollars, whatever, and so um, and so the Fed go or not the Fed, sorry, Department of Justice goes kicks down a door in New York into this 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 husband and wife couple's house, and they look like you know. Your complete, like, average Joe, clean cut, like, you would, this is not like, you know, doesn't look like a grimy criminal mastermind operation. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second, the funny bit about that. Uh, but basically, they seize, uh, like, their computers. They, they find um, a bunch of burner cell phones. They find, like, a bag of, like, $50,000 of cash. They find a bunch of, like, the hardware wallets that had the Bitcoins in them. And then they found like folders on their computer that were like fake passport ideas and like <laughs> like places to go, places to run away. Like they found like folders that said that shit on their computers. And um, and they seized three and a half billion dollars worth of Bitcoin because the price of Bitcoin has gone up so much. So that 70 million has become three and a half billion dollars worth. And so these guys were trying to launch. They, wow. they, they don't think these are the hackers, but they were trying to launder that money. They may have been the hackers. I don't know. They, that's not proven. But they were trying to launder the money. And the, the the DOJ had been like, if you've seen that meme of Charlie from It's Always Sunny where they have like the cork board and he's like trying to like find the, find the, the crime or solve the crime. That's what they had been doing because they had, they had this web of all these wallets. And finally they found that, oh, it's trying to cash out in this wallet owned by this guy, Ilya Dutch Lichtenstein or whatever. But how how did what what type of idiot would use his well, name? Well, eventually in a you need to get the money out. Just and so up? the problem is like, they were trying to get the money out through like but Walmart yeah, but gift cards. They were buying like five hundred dollar Walmart gift cards with Bitcoin. They were doing like PlayStation games. They were like tr they were trying all these small things, but they could never move the bulk of the money. So if you want to move like in mass, you got to do something that had that lets you move size. And usually those could you buy an NFT and then sell uh, it? No, well, you like eventually do that you need to get the money out of the wallet. That's the problem. So 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 the problem so. In order to do that, there's like an off ramp, right? How do you get it into, you know, U.S. dollars, for example, if that's what you wanted to do? Um, and, you know, he left it there for five and a half years, and they were probably living off it and spending it in some ways. But like, if you wanted to actually like get a lot of it out and get get it, 
uh, and remove the tr paper trail of the blockchain, you need to get it as an off ramp. But to get it as an off ramp, you have like a, um, you know, your idea, like these exchanges, they, they require you to upload your license and like they have laws they have to comply with called KYC, know your customer. And so eventually they found that somehow the DOJ, they didn't explain exactly, but they, they identified that the money was moving towards a wallet that was owned by a known person. That's how they ended up finding these guys. Now, the funny part is, that's awesome. Right, go ahead. So that, well, so the, I, when I read about this, I was like, wait, that name sounds so familiar. Both their names sound familiar. So the guy, it was, his name is Ilya I L Y A. I think it was like a very like weird name. His last name is Lichtenstein. So he spoke at the first HustleCon. I never talked to him, but um, he had a company called MixRank, which was just a normal startup, went through YC, and he spoke at HustleCon. And then his girlfriend or wife, she was a copywriter. And I remember talking a little bit with her because she, her name's yep. Heather Morgan, I think. And she had a um, a website all about yep. writing sales emails. Totally. Is like that right? Do you remember her? Or the hack. The day, she had like a red dress. Hack, she had like a LinkedIn yes. post on like, five hacks for your your cover letter for your job interview like you know like that sort of thing and so yeah she was doing that she and so they and, and the funny thing is like the reason the internet kind of went crazy with it was because here you had two very unlikely characters so um we had a bunch of friends text us or text me because i was writing this this edition of the milk road and i was like um anybody know this guy and you you knew him but some other people knew him they're like dude you would never get vibes of like, this guy might just go launder billions of dollars. It was like smart, like kind of no, quiet, what, like his guy, talk, like engineer type. Uh, he like, he like showed very little emotion. No, I did not think that this guy like, yeah. Had, and, and, no. and then her, she's like this, like super strange Kanye West level weird, uh, you know, like person. She, she basically, she had like an alter ego that was called Razzle Khan and Razzle Khan was her rap name. And then she has like these, super fucking cringy rap songs on youtube like dude okay i have you know i have uh, I, you know i think it'd be cool to be a rapper but if i hear myself there's no way i'm publishing that because it sounds so bad russell Kong, the versace better win come real far but don't know where i'm headed motherfucking crocodile of wall street silver on my fingers and boots on my feet always be a good and so uh so it's horrible it, it's so bad that the top comment was Paris Hilton. I'm going to prove to everyone that you can have uh, that having money means you can rap good. And then it said, Heather Morgan, <laughs> hold my beer. I didn't even know Paris Hilton has, has like a rap song. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. There's just like, she's like one of the strangest characters. Like I watched it. I went deep dude for this. I was writing this thing and I was like, Oh, let me get some examples. And then I couldn't look away. Cause like the, the train wreck, dude, it's like weird. there's videos she's of her so wedding uncomfortable. and like, she, she like, forced everybody to like they built like this golden mini Taj Mahal that she sat in and then her bridesmaids lifted it up on her shoulder and brought her in but even the the audience at her wedding is like uncomfortably clapping like off beat because they're like uh this is this normal there's like and there's like clearly only 14 people in the room and then she does a rap performance at the wedding that was like equally cringy and she's just like humping the air oh my it was just god super weird. to the guy Iliad Iliad yeah, he goes what, by what Dutch I guess so Dude, this freaking guy. Uh, I'm looking at these pictures. That's hilarious. This woman's really hard to look at. She is just cringe she, city. That, that should have been her rap she, name, Cringe City. That would have been like, okay, I get it. You're going to be the cringiest. Cool. Um, that's like Henry Cejudo. He the called cringiest himself, yeah, the, 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 the king of cringe. Uh, yeah, that's what she should have done. Like, it, it was super strange. But um, but yeah, basically they recovered it. And so now what's going to happen? Anyway, there's just a bunch of interesting little bits to it. So the DOJ is going to give the money back to Bitfinex, it looks like. Bitfinex had, when they they launched their own token at one point in time called the LEO token, that's like used in their, if you trade in their exchange, it'll give you a discount using the LEO token. So they had to put in a thing when they launched the LEO token, which was like, hey, if we ever recover anything from that hack, um, we'll use 80 up to 80% of it to buy back and burn our LEO token, which will cause like the price, you know, LEO holders to benefit from if we ever recover from this. And so now they're going to get like three and a half billion dollars to buy back. So the price of Leo token like shot up like whatever, 60% in 24 hours because people are like, oh, wow, that's going to be a lot. But they said, we're not going to just cause a bunch of sell pressure in the market. We're going to do a controlled sale over like a multi-year period um, so that it's like scheduled and doesn't like affect the Bitcoin market or whatever. Um, God, this is such a good story. This would make 
this is yeah, gonna be exactly. such that's a good what everyone movie. was saying. It's like here comes you know incoming incoming Netflix doc. Uh, have you seen the, this? I saw. The, I just watched this clip like every day for the past three days, and it just absolutely cracks me up. I was hoping Ben can uh, play it in the thing, but I don't think it'll work. I don't think the sound will come through. So, have you seen this clip of, of this interview of Bill Gates back in the day jumping over a chair? Yeah. Have you seen yes. this? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, like just a normal one of him jumping. Just the, so he's doing some interview with some woman about Microsoft, and she goes, she goes, is it true that you can leap over a chair? Is and that he, that impressive? And he goes, <laughs> it's not, well, first of all, it is impressive uh, for, for Bill Gates to be able to do that. Second of all, just well, I don't know why this is being talked about. And then he goes, so she goes, is it true that you could jump over a chair? And he goes. <laughs> It depends on the size of the chair. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, you know, just like, and then they cut. It's like a hard cut to a chair. <laughs> Bill Gates clearing it. Is it true that you can leap over a chair from a standing position? It depends on the size of the chair. Uh, I'll cheat a little bit. <laughs> yeah. That's and an old clip. So you've, you've just now seen that? I No, I came back into my life because I was thinking, uh, somebody had said something like, oh, yeah, you know, back in the day or... You know, in the good old days, somebody said some phrase like that. And in my head, I go, what are they even thinking about when they when they say that? And I go, I'm going to have I was like, what's the funniest back of the day thing? And I that clip came to mind. And so I decided anytime somebody says back in the day or, or you know, in the good old days, I'm going to think only of that moment where Bill Gates says depends on the depends on how I had the chair. Is. I always just think of Uncle Rico. Of <laughs> the Uncle Rico clip in Napoleon Dynamite where he goes, I used to be able to throw a pigskin over them mountains. All right, so listen, I did something that I did not think I was ever going to do. Um, so last Apparently. year, in 2021, or no, uh, 2020, whenever COVID happened, I launched this course that I, I don't even know if I ever talked about it, called the Ideation Bootcamp. I did it with Goggin. I invested in his company just like you did in Maven. You have already done two of them i think and you have a third coming up i decided to launch one i launched one the other day i only talked about it on twitter i've not talked about it on here yet but so if people want to do it it's called the ideation boot camp and it's basically my research um my research framework and how i research stuff it's but it's uh you go to maven.com so maven how do you say how do you like you say maven it rhymes with like raven uh, <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> with, with an M, but with the M at the end. No, the, no, no, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, and you could see my name is on the front page. But what they don't have yet, and this is what I told Goggin. They so me and Sean both invested in this company, and as part of investing in it, he made us promise to do courses. Yeah, um, which was actually a good kick in the ass because now I actually had to do it, and it, it has been fun. But um, he needs like custom URLs. He doesn't have that yet. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like maven.com slash blank slash whatever in order to, to get to your thing. But I just have, they made it for me. They made a power writing, power writing course.com. They're going to so, make it for me. So, but they, so they, but that, that goes there. But they have to make it for you. Yeah. But I'm, I'm doing this thing. It, I think it's going to be pretty badass. I think I'll continue doing it maybe once a year, but maybe I won't ever do it. I don't so know. Give an example. So give a teaser of like, Okay, so so this is about coming up with a great idea, figuring out. So coming up with ideas and then picking the ones that seem like better ideas than worse ideas in a short amount of time. Is that the hook? Yeah, I'll give one old example. So basically, yeah. when Trends launched, I wrote this article about plants. And I'm like, man, I think someone could build like an online nursery or an online plant business. And the reason why I came up with that idea is I read the annual report for 1-800-Flowers. And they said, the, of, and 1-800-Flowers is a big company, does a billion or something in revenue, so they've got a large perspective. And they said that our fastest growing segment is millennials buying succulents online. This is growing like crazy. And then I looked on, at their financials, and it looked like the, the majority of their profit came from people buying accessories, so chocolate or fancy pots. And I'm like, well, there's a fucking idea. You make succulents, and you make it like really cool pots that are artists, and you like figure out what the contribution margin is, and then... What Alex said about what did Alex say yesterday in the podcast, like opportunity of value or value of opportunity, like he like phrased it actually yeah. better than I've phrased it historically. But basically, you could do a bunch of math. It's really like simple arithmetic. And you're like, in order to get your repeat purchase rate, uh, the total addressable market times your contribution margin. And like, that's how you can come up with a good idea in that space, just off that one insight. And so that's an example. So I just list out all like my frameworks and how I research. And it started with reading the reading the annual report for 1-800-Flowers, which 
uh, that sounds like the most you know kind of unique starting point for finding not even just finding specific opportunities, but just like training your brain to think about the world wider than the the way you currently think about it. That's that's how I would phrase it because like I don't think you necessarily find the best ideas by being like, okay, I'm going to go read you know the Har- the HBS Business School, you know the Harvard Business School's annual report. And in there, I'm going to find a business idea. I think that's a little too hardcore. No, what, what, the way it works is you have this general thing. So this general thing is basically what's this combination of things that I'm interested in, things that I'm good at, and things that can make money. All right, I know what that general I thing is. I'm going to go to very particular places to find information that's going to help guide this. And what it's going to do is going to help me find a handful of problems that I'm interested in solving. And these problems for sure have demand for them. I'll give you an example of this, uh, how this played out in my life. So I, I invest in this company. The guy, a guy actually came to our podcast, our live podcast show in San Francisco, which was I like in your about. office. Very, you know, It was a very small crew, maybe 50 people, 75 people, something like that. I don't know what it was, but it was the very first live thing we ever did. And um, this guy comes up afterwards and he's like, uh, hey, that was great. Um, and I'm like, yeah, what do you Cool. What's your story? What do you do? And he's like, oh, I'm. I currently run the perception team on the self-driving cars uh, division of Uber. Um, he was very charming, very good looking. I was yeah, sold to handsome guy, uh, very, very confident. So he wasn't like, Hey, Kashan, can I just pitch you my idea? I really just want to tell you like that. That's always like, uh, sure, man. Uh, I'm, you talk while I think of a way to escape <laughs> is usually how that conversation goes. And so this was different. This guy was, you know, he, I was genuinely interested. Then he started saying things. And then I was like, Oh, so he's like, yeah, but I'm leaving to work on my own startup. Okay, what, what is it? Uh, what is it, Uber artificial intelligence guy? You know, like a uh, guy who works on the AI team at Uber. And so he was starting his own self-driving car company. And he's like, you know, here's what we're going to do. We're focusing on, he's like, you know, it's funny. I, I, I was, you know, I was looking at what we were doing at Uber. And he was like, what stood out, what jumped out to me, and this is kind of like one of your ideation things, is like, sometimes so, a stat will come out. And um, at Twitch, my, the CEO, Emmett, he used to call the, the, he used to say, sometimes you look at data, not for a specific answer, but just to find something that makes you go, huh, or like, that's weird. That can't be right, can it? And um, and so he used to, the CEO, Emmett, he used to mention, like, you don't always go looking, do a, write a SQL query just to get a specific answer. Sometimes you just browse until something jumps out at you as being like, not what you, not on trend. And so anyways, he, this guy had said, 75% of all um, Uber rides are like, you know, one passenger going less than, or it was like 60%, 60 something percent were, go, were one passenger and 60% were going less than three miles. So it's like short trips of just one person inside of a dense city. And he's like, you know, so it's kind of crazy, right? We have this like four person, maybe six person, six seater car that weighs thousands of tons with, a, with one driver driving one person, one mile. Like that seems inefficient. And so he was trying to create a, a, a new vehicle that was like a one person vehicle, one or two person vehicle that was electric and self-driving and optimized for very short trips. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. But anyways, I invest 50,000 bucks. You fast forward like a year and, uh, you know, he's like grinding away in this garage in San Mateo, uh, trying to get a car to drive itself. <laughs> and I would go down to the, he was working literally out of a storage unit. So I would go to the storage container, like kind of a, what's it called? Like a like whatever. public storage or something? Public storage, yeah, literally. Uh, and then he'd roll up the garage on like unit 333 or whatever. And then he'd put me in it. He'd be like, all right, let's see if it works. And then we'd drive in a circle around the storage facility, a uh, storage like a parking lot. And it was like, whoa, that was bizarre to sit there and just like it have worked. the thing drive me. Yeah, so it was working, but it was very, you know, like that's a closed environment. It's pretty easy to get that to work. But he was working on, okay, now let's take it out a mile. Okay, now let's go get a sandwich from the shop. And like, that's what he was doing for like a year. So anyways, um, he at the time, the idea, the initial idea was like to be kind of like an Uber competitor, right? Like somebody will just push a button. This ride will show up, a roll up to them with no driver inside. They hop in, they actually drive themselves to the location. Then they le- they just walk out and the thing will drive to the next passenger by itself. And I was like, oh, that's a really cool idea. And we were trying to figure it out. And I felt like we were hitting a wall. And this is where something like your course will help because if you're if you're if all your ideas are boxed into your own life experiences and you're like a you know 27 year old engineer who's worked at you know tech companies like your life experiences are pretty narrow. And only once we got out of that and started like 
figuring out these little like you know, like these, 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 these unique spots, like when you, when you read an annual report, you go, huh? So I was reading an annual report. I, or we talked to, a, we just took a random meeting. We took a random meeting with some transportation lawyer. And he mentioned that he does work for this company. And I looked up that company and it's basically like this, I don't know, like $30 billion company that I've never heard of. And what did it do? They partner with like 15 cities and they go to the city and they say, Hey, um, you need buses and scooters and, ferries and trains and all that stuff. Yeah. You just commission us. We'll, we'll bid for your, for the right to run transportation in your city. And they would get, and so this, the whole $30 billion company or whatever was like off of like 15 city contracts. And then I thought about, it, I was like, Oh, of course, like San Francisco doesn't run their own buses. Like, you know, or whatever, not every city is going to want to be in the transportation business. They just contracted out to some vendor. And I was like, man, that's an amazing business. Cause that vendor now has lock in, like the city's not going to change. So they're just going to like, they just get to eat up. They have a monopoly on city transport. And then that got me thinking about those city bike share programs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you've seen those city bikes, they're awesome. and then their annual reports were online. And I went and I read about it and city bike did the same model. They went to New York and they built like a hundred million dollar revenue business doing city bikes in New York. And they were the only ones who had Crazy. the license to do it. And then they did it in San Francisco. And then they sold to Lyft for, I don't know, some hundreds of millions of dollars. And I thought that's a really cool model. And so then we started brainstorming, dude, could you go to a city? that needs this type of transport, like a different type of transport than what they already have with their buses and whatever, and just say, we'll be the vendor for you. And that's exactly what they did. They went to Las Vegas. Did it work? Uh, yeah. Is it, well, I, I haven't talked to them recently, but yeah, they got a contract basically with Las Vegas where the city was like, yeah, we have this thing called a transportation desert. It's like a place where our routes don't really go, but a lot of people yeah. need to go in this area and they're complaining to us about it. So, you know, yeah, we'll pay you guys. We'll, we'll pre-buy you know, like quarter million dollars of rides from you. Um, and so it's like, instead of trying to get half a quarter million people to download your app, like Uber, yeah, and yeah, do whatever, yeah. you got one city official to say, I'll buy $250,000 worth of rides. And that'll last us a few months. And let's see how that goes. And that's what you and I do to people. So because we just study and break down stuff, I think you, you and I go through the same discovery and aha moment. I hope that our audience does, which is basically you see it. Once you know what's possible, or once you know like what other people is possible, your standard of what's possible kind of changes. And you're like, well, of course I could do that. They did that. And they did it by doing this, this, and this. Like, I already know exactly how they did it. It's like, um, it, it, it would kind of be like me telling you, well, just go get big muscles. It's like, I don't, I, I can't get big <laughs> muscles. Like, I don't know what that means. Versus like, well, just lift this weight, do it four times a week. And, and here, I'll remind you every single time and you could do it. It's so, like when you know like a specific routine or you know what's possible, it definitely changes your perspective on what you should be doing. And uh, hopefully that's what the podcast does, but that's what the course will be doing. But uh, I don't know. I wanted to. So go sign up. Where do they go? Maven.com. Maven.com. They'll see your face. They'll see my face. And it's called the ID. It's cool. And then you have one too on the, uh, it's called the ideation bootcamp. You have one too. The the power writing course. This is your third time doing it. My third time doing it. Yeah. And you did it because you're like, uh, people like, I think Goggin said that you have the second highest rated course. Yeah. Yeah. I forget who had number one. It's but he good said that, and, uh, you know, uh, second place is the best place. Uh, it, was I, it I still have somewhere first? to reach, is it second but I'm or still at the top. <laughs> I don't remember which one he said. It was like either one or two. I think we don't, uh, I don't really care about highest rated because I was like, you know, honestly, people's rating will be more based on themselves. Like, it's just like, actually, to use your gym example, um, most people aren't like, if, if you're out of shape, it's not because you have the wrong workout program and trainer it's because you know most likely you're not even going to the gym then if you are going to the gym you're not working going consistently if you're not going consistently if you're even if you are going consistently you're not working out with intensity and then comes the program for back buys and shoulders that's going to help you get the ma most gains and so similarly like i had um it's like yeah we had a high rated course but then i looked at it, i was like man 15 or 20 percent of people just never showed up to a single one they paid and never showed up like damn that's that's on them I don't like think, you know, i don't think you could solve that yeah, well, you know, and I and I luckily I was wise enough to not have heartache over that because I was like, that's actually just like a completely common pattern with all online education is people don't finish or they don't start for something that they'll even pay a bunch of money for, which is really wild. So it's like of the people that come, what what kind of experience do they have? And then, you know, six months, nine months later, are you still getting emails being like, yo, I used your thing. It was, you know, I got this outcome out of it. That's like, that's the only real true measure of success. And I don't think if 100 people go into the course, it's not going to be a hundred people who have that 20 people aren't even going to show up 
you know, 60% of people, 60 of them are going to forget everything within a year or never, never implement it. And really it's the, like the 15 to 20 out of a hundred that go like use the thing and better their better themselves. Yeah. It sucks. Um, can, do you want to talk about this Bitcoin, Bitcoin couple? What do you want to talk about? Uh, I have, okay. So I have a couple ideas and then I have a couple random topics, but let's do ideas first. Um, so I want to get, I want to shout out a couple ideas that I saw other people saying that I thought were kind of interesting. So, uh, here's the first one. So you invested in this thing, uh, stonks.com, right? I did. And, uh, explain for people who don't know what stonks is, explain what it is. Cause it's actually it's kind of like pretty dope. I, I had the opportunity to invest. I know the guy super well who started it. Uh, he was our biggest competitor when we were doing my startup. Uh, so I was like watching them. I like kind of saw how they operate. So I knew these, these guys are really good. But I didn't get the idea fully right away. And the valuation was really high because they have a good track record. So I was like, ah, okay, I'll just pass. I'll be a user, not an investor. You invested. So explain what it is. Yeah. So it's like Shark Tank meets AngelList. And so AngelList is a platform where you can, uh, if anyone starts a company, they can go on and they can get investors and they make it easy. So anyone could invest like $1,000 into your company. And you know what Shark Tank is. And so basically stocks, you it's spelled uh, like... The reason I was like, is this going to work? Because it's spelled like a joke. It's like a meme. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It looks like it's like spelled like a meme. And like their logo is like a silly. It's like the Wall Street Bets guy. But it's uh, so once a how often? What's the cadence now? Is it every day or once a week? No, I don't think it's every day. I think it's once a week or so. So uh, once a week. But then they have like big ones that are once a month. And they do some pre-vetting and they find interesting startups. And all types of entre- uh, investors are on the phone or on the call listening and they could ping in with a question and the whole audience can watch in real time. And so I've been a guest, I've been an investor, or they call it investors, where you're like, you're able to ask questions. And I've seen people write checks for fifty and $100,000 live to the invest. The experience is like a live, like a Twitch channel, basically. Like an auction. So a startup goes up, they pitch their thing. The invest, Some investors can ask questions in the chat. Some are asking questions live. And then you just see in the chat, it's like, so-and-so is investing $10,000. So-and-so is putting in $40,000. So-and-so is putting $2,000 in. Have you seen and, one where people... They'll, have... they'll raise, like... I think somebody raised over $10 million in 10 minutes. Is that right? Like, I think... Th- well, the company raised $10 million. Stocks right. raised money from guys like me, but and then Andreessen Horowitz, just like angel investors, and then they let their users invest, and they raised, and like, them. $10 or $15 million in a few hours. And so so what is, what's cool is you're a founder. Normally, your fundraising is, like, this multi-month process that you're almost dreading getting started with. You're like, okay, I got to first get all my ducks in a row. And then I got to start reaching out and figure making a list, a pipeline to reach out to, and then asking people to go out to coffees or asking for intros and following up and then pitching and then follow up meetings. This shrinks that three month process into like seven minutes on stage. That's what's dope about this for the, for the uh, founder, for the investor. It's also a time saver, right? Because and. Uh, my job is to look at interesting companies. So these guys, if they're doing the hard work of curating them and putting them on stage and letting me make a snap decision, they're creating a demo day basically where they, they pack in a bunch of good startups and in, in theory, right? And it, the, the whole, it's either going to work because they curate great startups or it's going to not work because the great startups don't want to do this. Well, how did and you that's not the invest in break. this? When, when I talked to him, I was like, oh, this is a no brainer. I, I only invested ten thousand dollars, but it was because it, it, I would I would have done more. But uh, this was he a no brainer. Me early on, he was like, you know, it's Twitch for um, Twitch for angel investing, and I've just seen every other live streaming. Pro- I had too much battle scars. Like I've seen so many live streaming products fail, and I was like, bro, why are you going into this? You know that as well as I do. You know, like that's so hard to do. I didn't really understand what he was saying as the idea, and then. He, I was like, so I asked him a couple questions. He sent me the memo and then I saw the valuation and I was like, ah, uh, so I think it's a dope idea. Okay. So now here's the, the riff on it. Right. So that's cool in and of itself. So, uh, Elaine Zelby, who's been on the pod a couple times before, and she, uh, she's, uh, she's an idea person just like us. So she had this idea that I thought was pretty cool. She goes stonks.com for other things. <laughs> it's like, Can I, t- I agree. Can I tell you what one of our friends, uh, Moise Ali tweeted something and it needs to be for homes. Stonks for homes, be, like it's because what the the cool thing about stonks is you could see what other what questions other smart people are asking, and with cars. So bring a bring a bring a trailer. My favorite car website. 
it has a comment section and I could see what smart people are asking. Like, is this a 67 or a, a, a 1967 or a 1968? Because the 1967s offered this thing and the real collector's items right. at 68s. But you know what? I, I'm just picking that up. But with, and with houses, it's the same thing. Like, I, I remember our home, like our realtor was saying, like, is this made out of stucco or this other thing? And I'm like, I don't know what any of that is. And then they're <laughs> like, did you guys like spray the installation or is it like a, I'm like, I, I don't know what that means. I, I I wish I could see like what questions I knew smart people were asking. Oh, and I wish you could do that live. Work. OK, it's, I wish I could. I wish. And then you could have an upvote, uh, an upvote. And I think I would like it to be for houses. So I think, uh, OK, that's interesting. The one that she had said that I thought was pretty cool was hiring. So stonks.com for people. Okay, so Oof. how does that work? So, okay, there's general hiring, which is like, you know, our hiring is like this like large spectrum from like temp staffing, where I just need like an hourly employee to show up today. And then like tomorrow, they may not come back to like Craigslist to uh, then you get to like LinkedIn and Indeed, which is kind of like mass market. If I'm a if I'm a, you know, junior, you know, or I'm, I'm a mid-level marketing manager, I might get job opportunities on LinkedIn or Indeed. That might be where I go look. Then you have like AngelList, like play, vertical places where it's like, if I want a job in startups, I won't go to Indeed. I'll go to AngelList because that's where the startups hire or the, that's a job board for startups. And so then you have this one like really interesting thing. And then you have like headhunters, which do executive placements and kind of like, uh, you know, how do you find a CMO? You hire a headhunter, you pay them a ton of money, and then they get like a, a huge cut. So somewhere in there, I think there's an opportunity to let people hire like top talent live like this. So if you were able to, essentially, it's like a reverse job interview. So instead of me going and interviewing, Dude, with you know what this kind of reminds me of, and it's kind of, I'll say it though, this kind of sounds like a like a like a slave auction. Yeah, I knew you were gonna say, I knew you were gonna go there. And actually, this makes me it makes me a little. This makes me very uncomfortable actually. Like I that I mean like. A talent auction? Is that what we're going to call it now? Dude, it's, it's, yes, at will, bro. It's like you get paid, you're at yeah, will, you I don't know. have to do it. It's, right? like, that's like saying employment is slavery, right? It's not. Um, and so, so, But there was a, a website, I don't know if you saw it call, come out, that called, it was called Developer Auction. And it was controversial no. for this exact reason. So this came out maybe six years ago or so. It ended up, um, it got really hot. So what they were doing was they were saying, look, how did, developers how, how did you know demand. about this company? It was like part of YC or they were... They piggybacked on YC in some way. I don't remember if they were a YC company or what they did was they were like, we're only going to take developers or we're only going to let YC companies hire from this place. So it's like, if you're a dev who wants to work for a YC company, come Got on it. to developer auction, you get the highest dollar bid because these guys have money and they want great devs. Which which was just a little bit of icing on the douche cake. Like you're doing, <laughs> you're, you're doing a, an auction. <laughs> yeah, you're doing an auction. Now you're doing it only for YC. Yeah. Just, the, that's the lay. That's the cherry on top of the douchebag cake. The, the du douche de leche cake. Yeah. So, so basically, <laughs> they they kind of did that. And so, what was happening was developers were getting way more money on this, and they also didn't have to do like a multi week job interviewing process. It was like they say, "Hey, yeah, I was at Reddit early ish, first forty employees. I worked on the fraud fraud system and this and this. I'm interested in uh, you know companies doing machine learning, and then boom, job offer." and job offer at a 20% premium and developer auction, all they had to do was just say, they just had That's to be cool. like Harvard. They just had to be selective. It's like, no, not any company can just apply here. We're going to pick. And then no, not any developer can apply here. We're going to pick. Now, ultimately, I don't think the model worked because they're not like the biggest thing ever now. I think they ended up like kind of pivoting or softening it. Well, all talent marketplaces are really hard businesses, I think. To scale, yeah. Um, yeah, to scale. I think there, you could have a lot of, you can have like, you can be a just a recruiter and make millions of dollars a year. You could be just a job board and make millions of dollars a year. But if you want to be hired.com, then it, I, I don't know if it can, it's really hard to work. So I think the trick here is to do it with something that's visual. So, okay, Stonks is cool because it's a live video stream. So one question is, what, in what, what category does having a visual screen that's showing you something work way better than a resume that was attached to an email or a job board. And so I think like potentially designers or even something like more niche than that, like 3d designers, video editors, graphics, something like that. Um, like this could be maybe how like the video game industry hires or something like that. I don't know. There's, there's something there to doing this. Yeah, that's model. what she said, Elaine. She said, I, uh, I don't know. I, yeah. I didn't, I didn't see which exact example she, she had the example of hiring and I didn't even read on. I was like, yeah, great idea. Let me just like riff off that. That's pretty interesting. Um, so I thought that was cool. And then I think there's probably some other areas where you could do that. And I think the trick is normally the reason live stream products fail is because the viewers, you're competing. Like you don't want to compete for viewers with people who are just doing this for leisure. 
um, because they have a ton of options. They can just open TikTok. They can, you know, go for a walk. They can do anything. You need people, you need the viewers of the, the buy side for this to be their job. Um, so that's why actually real estate or real estate investors, instead of maybe even, maybe it's not just for buying my home that I'm going to go live in, but maybe it's like multifamily properties get auctioned off in this way. And it's multifamily investors that are showing up to, to buy pieces of that action or something like that. I think, I think that'd be cool. I, I think I told you this, a hypothesis I had in 2012, or I, I remember when I was in the apartment business, we, we had like a, a, an apartment finder thing. And a, I was like, I'm pretty sure that people it's not that far away that people are going to start renting homes and buying homes without ever seeing them in person. Like, 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 uh, this was before Matterport was around. And I think we're there. Like I, I would buy a house. Would you buy a house without seeing it? No, I would maybe not mind rent. I for sure would rent a place without seeing it. Yeah. Uh, I maybe that, yeah. would buy, but I think I, I, there's a world I think where we're going to buy them soon without ever seeing a house. Right. The other one that's kind of all out of left field here is, did you ever watch the Zoom Bachelor that some of our friends did? Shield was the Zoom Bachelor. Did you ever watch it? Uh, no, I don't watch that shit, though. <laughs> I, was play, it awesome? I play real sports. <laughs> well, I just don't watch reality TV. You know, I, I, no, no, I watch good stuff. It was like it was like just people do it. It wasn't real TV even, but it was basically like, I know, I'm here's Shield. He's, a, he's an investor. He's single. He's a good guy. Awesome? We think he's great. And so as a, as a joke, as a kind of a lark, they created a, a, a live stream and they curated a bunch of single women and they were like, all right. Uh, and they basically, in the course of an hour, it was like, here's six women. They introduce themselves. He cuts two. It was like, all right, of the four women, now he's going to ask you a question like, all right, what's your ideal Friday night date? What would we do? And then she, one girl's like, oh, I think we would, whatever, like just how many stay people home, watched watch it? movie, whatever. There was like, I don't know, like 500 people live watching it, which is a pretty big like live stream That's channel. pretty good. Um, and this was like, again, it was all kind of done as a joke. It was just friends. I, I don't think that any of them really wanted to date each other, but it was just like to do the show. But maybe there's something like that, right? The Bachelor is one of the highest rated shows ever. And then you see stuff that's like, a good um, idea. Uh, there's like a matchmaker show on Netflix. That's like Indian matchmaker or something like that. As people pay thousands of dollars to like, uh, to matchmakers to find like kind of like eligible candidates. Like that's a, that's a, that is a niche thing that exists. In every well, city. You and I have a fr- you have an I you and I have a single friend and I for a gift I nearly bought him a four thousand dollar matchmaker. And I didn't end up going through with it because I was like, I don't know if they're gonna like follow through with this and that's too much money to spend if they don't do it. <laughs> and I don't know if they're gonna find it insulting. But I was like, I interviewed this lady three different times. I'm like trying to figure out this would be the right for, fit for our friend. Um I think that I think they're interesting. I think more people should use them. And so I think they're if there was a private version of this that was, you know, you, it was more expensive. Um, well, so now we're talking about auctioning off sex. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, well, we're talking about auctioning off the things people want, right? <laughs> and so, yeah, it just so happens to be talent, sex, things like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's cool. There's a, there's I'm, a great I'm quote, by the way. Uh, Ev Williams has said this quote. Ev Williams started uh, Twitter and Blogger before that and Medium now. He, uh, he goes, here's the recipe for a billion dollar internet company. Have you heard this quote before? He goes, Here, here's, no. the, here's the recipe for a billion dollar internet company. Take a human desire, preferably one that's been around for hundreds of years. Use technology to remove steps. And, um, and that was his whole thing. He's like, you know, <laughs> and so he's like, that's how I built that's Blogger, great. Twitter, everything else. I, Twitter took out a bunch of steps for a human desire that people had. And um and I, I think that's just like, you know, sounds stupidly simple, but is actually true. Let me tell you about something that I saw. I did not research this at all for this talk, but I wanted to just bring it up because we were talking some, about something similar. Um, I'm trying to find, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to manage. So I bought this farm. I need to like get a manager to help run it. And there's these property management companies, but they don't really have like the touch. It's a little sterile. And like to make this work the way I want it to work, I want someone that's a little bit more close to it. Um, so in your brain, in your head, what, when I think of an outsourced person, like what's like the image that you're, that I, that you get, can you, ex- to give you explain bro? that to me? No, <laughs> no, just, just tell me like what outsourced VR, uh, a, a virtual assistant. Yeah. VA. Like, I don't know, somebody in the Philippines or India who's, you know, sitting at a desk, uh, you know, typing away for, for like in a call center style yeah, environment. Call center style, exactly. Okay. Now, when I say um, military ah. spouse, military spouse, what comes to your mind? Um, 
patriot what uh, American what patriot, they... a woman in America, uh, white, blonde hair, uh, speaks great English, sitting, you know, in the comfort of her, uh, you know, her home office, uh, talking to, you know, customers. What attributes are there? Uh, are there any? Loyal, organized, um, trustworthy, things like that. Exactly. So there's this company called Squared Away. So Google Squared Away. We've talked about company... them on here before, by the way. Yes, we have. Uh, but I didn't get it. We talked about one episode. <laughs> we did one. We did one episode where we talked about um, like a cool way to come up with the, a type of company that you want is uh, who would you want to hire? Mm -hmm. Like what demographic do you want to hire? So well, who do you want to serve? Right. That's another one. Right. Yeah. Who do you want to serve? Ultimately, going to be serving a customer, and so it helps a lot if you care about them and and understand them and want want more of them to be around you every day. So mill uh, go uh, what's it called? Go squared away. I don't know why it's called go squared away, or maybe it's just called the, the squared business is away. squared away. The domain they just couldn't get squared away. That comp probably. And it's the most expense. The cheapest tier is two hundred dollars for way, five hours. Great month. copy on this website. Look at this. So what? It's okay, great. Let's, let's it's compare great. this. So what's another what's another outsourcing company? Like, let, can we just find like Upwork? Like uh go to um let me just Google like outsourcing or let's say virtual assistant for uh, yeah, virtual assistant. If they show up on the top of Google, they might have good copywriting, but while you're looking for that, so the copywriting on this page, so you go to uh squared away, it says the best company perk is personal assistance for your entire team. Our, our team of military spouses gives you your time back. And it's so, a picture of a lady holding up her sign, waiting for her husband to get off the plane from like coming home. So from compare Iraq. this screen. So Ben, open up flexjobs.com. This, this is just a perfect example. Uh, uh, Flexjobs is not terrible, right? Like it's, it showed up at the top of Google. It's not, a I don't, I've never used a service. I'm not saying that. I'm saying just the website. It's not horrible, um, but it's not special and it doesn't make you feel anything. Right. So I can't. Read so it. so just it. compare the feelings. OK, so and if you're on, you should be watching on YouTube to be able to see this. So if I go to Flex Jobs, I see this kind of like blue and orange tacky site with stock photos of literally men and women in corporate outfits running away, running away, like doing a ballet leap away from you. And then it says the number one job site to find vetted remote work from home and flexible job opportunities since 2007. OK, great. And then it and then it's like Good Morning America, CNN, Wall Street Journal, whatever. Okay, so this is it's okay. And the headline is find a better way to work. Generic, vague, doesn't make me feel anything. Um, and you know, just the, this is this doesn't do it. Now go back to go squared away. Go squared away. What do they say? The best company perk, personal assistance for your entire team. So already they're selling the benefit, right? You who's coming here is probably looking to hire a personal assistant. Um, and they, um, and they focus on, they, they frame it as this is the best perk you can offer your employees instead of just find a personal assistant, which assumes you already know you want a personal assistant. They sell you the benefit of having a personal assistant that you're providing the best perk for your team. Then they have this like black and white photo of like a military mom holding a child's hand with a sign, you know, uh, you know, like I'm thinking of thinking of you, daddy. As you know, the as he leaves for the plane, she's like at an airport hangar, right? Like an emotional scene, and she seems like somebody who you would want to support, you would love to like help this woman out, and that she seems like somebody who you would want, not like you know this <laughs> this stock photo photo of a corporate person running away from you. <laughs> how crazy is that? This is beautiful branding because I don't know how many people are in the military, but like a military spouse is not like. I mean, uh, that's a, that, it's not that, ex, uh, uh, it's not that rare. So like I, I may hire these people for doing all types of jobs and they are a military spouse, but as soon as they that brand it yeah. as I, I'm like, oh, well you definitely are, are a good yeah, person. Exactly. Like, even though I've, I, they, it doesn't necessarily mean they're a great person, but for some reason I think that even though Dude, you're a good person you know, for bringing it, this company up. Yeah, right. Bonus points. You yeah. Bring, yeah. You're, you're, uh, you know, you, you get free, free virtue for, for having brought this company up as something cool. Is this beautiful branding this or what? Awesome. Like, why, why did we even, why did we talk about this before? Uh, we talked about it before. Same thing. We were talking about uh, the stay at home mom workforce and like, how do you tap into that? Like labor markets that are under, underutilized. So excess talent that doesn't, that's, that's looking for a job. And we talked about, you know, what could you do with stay at home moms? And then we brought this up and they actually shared the clip because they were like, Hey, this was cool. We got like featured on this thing. 
And so that's how I remember that we've talked about it before. But uh, I don't, how did we get here? And, what were you talking about? So you were talking about the. Oh, well, I don't. I don't remember. We are. We. Are, I think you're talking about like talent, right. like talent marketplaces. And I was. And I just. I. I, I didn't even research. I'm. I signed up for. Uh, what. What's it called? Get squared. Squared away. Squared away. <laughs> I entered. The, I'm waiting for them to call me back. But I signed up because I. But when I went to it, I was like, Oh my god, I'm in love. I want. I want to hire this woman in the picture. Like, I feel I, like I need if, her. To- if I hire. If I use the service. It like washes away the fact that I like don't do compost <laughs> that I yeah. forgot to recycle yeah, that bottle. I feel it. <laughs> and I feel like the, the woman's just going to have my back so right. hard. Like she's just going to like just so much loyalty. <laughs> she's not and your I spouse, they dude. <laughs> <laughs> no, but she's my partner. That's like how I feel. And I just thought they don't, they, this website, I've never seen, I've never felt this way about a, a job website <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh jonathan brought up wife you were talking about this. managing your ranch so you were saying you, were, you might use this instead or just kind of it reminded you that nobody's doing that in the property no, I'm, management I'm, space of making you feel the way that this makes you feel about assistance is that right i don't even remember the angle that i uh, had whatever. but yes i think i'm going to use this to manage my ranch but i thought i thought that'd be cool company and good Can example of a, of a landing page so uh all right so let's let's go to another one so can i tell you uh or i'll do a quick one i just want to get your take on this so I follow this guy, uh, and I don't know if this is his name because it sounds like a fake name. I've been talking to him. I just sort of realized. I don't know if this is his real name. Uh, but his, his Twitter handle is Peer Rich. And, um, and I don't know if, he's, if his name is Peer Rich. <laughs> his name is Al Kahala. Okay, his name is, P- <laughs> his name is Peer Richelson. Uh, Peer Richelson. So that's his name. Uh, so anyways, he, he's, uh, he's another guy who tried a talent marketplace and now has pivoted to something sweet. So, uh, he had initially, he had a YC company and it like didn't work out. And then he like, as a, like, they just needed money and they were like, yo, we just shut down our company. Um, you can, you can hire us. We're a YC duo. You can just hire us. We'll do a project for you for like, as a contractor for like two weeks cost money, but like, you're getting a YC founder duo. Where can you hire that? Oh my God. And I was like, dude, this is fucking amazing. I was like, I would love to hire YC founder duos. And I was like, if you think about it, like some number, maybe 20, 30, 40% of YC companies are going to shut down. And like, you know, those people might just go get jobs, but actually it might be cool for them to like continue to brand themselves as a YC company, as a YC founders and be able to be hired, be able for hire. So they did that for a little bit. And I thought that was cool. That's how I got in touch with them. Now he's doing something called cal.com. Have you seen this? It's a competitor to Calendly. Mm-hmm. Cal. Great, great domain, Which, domain, just C-A-L. Uh-huh. All right. All right. So scheduling infrastructure for absolutely everyone. Yeah. So basically what they are is we've talked about Calendly, Calendly before. Calendly basically gives you a little a link that's a calendar where somebody can book you. And so that's great for like a salesperson who's like, uh, hey, yeah, I would love to chat about, you know, how we might be able to help you out. Here's a link to my calendar. Grab a time that works for you. And it like lets you go pick a time. It emails both of you a calendar invite. It like takes care of the whole like booking process. So Calendly had become like a... I think a billion dollar plus company, uh, uh, recently, like $2 billion dollar company. Dollars. And there's, they're, aren't they like, weren't they bootstrapped for like a really long time or something crazy? They had like, yeah, the guy was an African immigrant who, uh, bootstrapped it to like 20 million in revenue raised around at like a billion. And then recently raised another round at like two or three right, so or this, four. So that business is working. So cal.com I think is a great competitor. So I'm going to invest in this because I believe in this model that they're doing, which is commercial open source software. So Cal, uh, Calendly is not open source. Cal.com is, is open source. What does that mean? That means you can, A, you can read the source code. B, you can basically like self-host it. So a lot of companies don't want their kind of like data and for information in the hands of another company. They like to be able to self-host the software that they're using and also be able to fork it or remix it in some way that like is customizable to them. And so these guys are growing fast. I switched over from Calendly. Now I use Cal. Is it awesome? Uh, yeah, it's a sick product. And you could you embed these on your website. So it's like, if you have a website, you're like, I don't know, uh, you give people, you're, you're a lawyer. You need people, like, instead of saying, here's a contact us form, and then one of our humans will reach out to you, and then we'll try to schedule a time. And by that time, you already forgot how interested you were. So what this does is, says, dude, just embed your, your booking calendar right here, and it reads your existing calendar, so it won't let anybody book a time that's already taken. And you could set up rules like, don't do meeting. Like I need a minimum 10 minute gap in between meetings or whatever. Right. You set some rules then you just embed that right here. So in the heat of the moment, when somebody's interested, you can grab that lead right away and get them booked for a meeting. 
And so do, but how do you use it? You're not a company. You're just so I'll use it either for, if I'm going to invest in a company, if I'm, if I'm doing talking to a founder and it's like, Hey, yeah, we'd love to chat sometime next week. All right. You know, here's my calendar. Feel free to grab any time that works for you. Um, and some people find that like offensive, whatever. I, I don't know. People are too sensitive about shit. Like, you know, just trying to be, it's, we're trying to, trying to make it flexible for the other person to pick whatever time works for them without requiring four email back and forth or pawning you off to my assistant. Who's going to like take it from here. Um, and you'll have to email them four times to find a time that works. And so, uh, so I use it for that. I'll also use it for like random meetings. So I'll have a Calendly that's just, you know, like I'll have, I'll have like, you know, just backslash Sean and I'll put like a one hour of random meetings once per month that anybody on the internet can go book. And so those are ways that, that I just add a little like randomness and serendipity into my life. That's like in a controlled fashion of when, when it can happen. Dude, this is cool. You, they did a really funny flex. So if you go to the website, you see a thing that says claim your username. And when you f refresh consistently, you see different names in the autofilled example. And it's all people who are well known and I bet are investors yeah. of the company. And you see that and you're like, oh, well, James Brashear is right. a Naval, this person. Yeah, those guys are, they are investors. It's, yeah. Isn't that funny how they did that? Yeah, that's cool. And that's I think good, there, if, you, if you look, by the way, hack. this is a common model. There's a closed source winner and there's an open source winner for a bunch of different categories in software. So this is just like a, a very simple way to find good deals is if you if you missed out or you, you see a great company that's like completely closed source, just Google for the commercial open source company. And then if they have a great team behind them, there's usually like a separate segment of the market that's quite large that they can go attack just by going from this like open source self-hosted yeah. model. These guys have exploded. They went from like nothing to a lot of traffic. They're, they're growing fast. Yeah, you should invest too. I'll, I can introduce you. Yeah, do it. I would love, I love this stuff. Can we talk about the Bitcoin thing, please? Uh, yeah, <laughs> let's do it. By the way, I didn't even say his idea. All right. Uh, that, that whole thing wasn't even the thing. Oh, uh, what's the idea? His idea I was, this he tweeted was this out. He goes, um, I wish somebody built this called the Anywhere School. And I think this is just kind of interesting. So he goes, the Anywhere School is for people who want to travel the world, but they don't want their kids' to, education to suffer. So here's how it goes. The, and he put out just like a one page PDF memo of just like, here's what it would be. If anyone's building this, like, you know, take this and run with it and let me know. And so what it was is like, you join a classroom, but it's a traveling classroom around the world. So the classroom is going to be like, we're going to spend three months this year in Paris, you know, three months in Bali and three months in wherever, you know, like Thailand and three months in, in South Africa. And the family and the kids go with it. So the kids get a consistent structure. The teacher stays the same. Their friends stay the same. But they get to experience a, a year of, of world travel. And, um, and so it's like for, for, for people who want to have travel but don't want to wait or don't want to trade off their kids' stability and education. And I actually think that's a kind of a cool idea. And I, I don't think this is like a huge, huge business. Maybe it's bigger than I think. But I just think that's awesome. And that should exist. That's pretty neat. So the Anywhere that's School, I think cool. that's a dope I'm idea. I'm on board. And that... And, and I also think it's a, I, well, I was Googling anywhere school and uh, there, there's nothing interesting. It's a great, great um, name, right? I think it's a great name. It's a uh, great name. Okay, let's, let's do the Bitcoin thing. Yeah, I'm on thing, board so. with anywhere school. Wait, really quick, before we get to that, what were you going to say about Strauss oh, Zelnick? Dude, you're going to love this. So, you, you know, you I know. About I, this I know. Thing? So, do you, do you explain who he yeah, is. Yeah, so there's this guy named, so there's this guy named Strauss. How do you pronounce yeah, his Zelnick, name? Zelnick, I think is right. Zelnick? Uh, I'm, I'm just doing this off memory, so correct me. I think he's the CEO of uh, a uh, Take Two Interactive, which is basically the owner or creator of uh, and Grand Theft Auto yeah. and like and like eight other games that are of that caliber. So like um, maybe like a five or ten billion dollar a year company that owns like the biggest video games in the world, and he's probably in his mid yep. to late fifties, and he looks like a GI Joe. <laughs> So he's say. this like jacked dude who gets up at like 5 a.m. in New York and works out really hard. And a lot of people are invited to go work out with him. Um, but it's all like high caliber, get after yes, it. Type that's of exactly folks. right. So he created a kind of like I call it the breakfast club, but it's basically like a morning, a morning workout club. And Ben, you can Google this. So there's a, a YouTube video that's called Strauss Zelnick's Invitation Only Fitness Club. It's a two minute video. So it's just like really easy to watch. And you can see basically um, when you go to it, it's like, he goes, he goes, I made a decision. 
that I was going to treat fitness as a like important part of my schedule. So like, okay, I'm a CEO. If I had a board meeting, I w I'm not going to skip it or move it because I'm feeling tired. Right. So he's like, I'm going to treat fitness the same way that I would treat uh, like, like a, like a meeting or family time or whatever. Like I'm going to put it like first order importance. And then he's like, but you know, how do I like juice this up? And I'm a big fan of this. This is a, a big life hack, which is multiply activities. So you know, like I've done this before too, which is you want to uh, hang out with cool people or have friends, but you, you don't, you know, you, you only have maybe like one hour of recreation a day. So are you going to choose fitness or friends? Well, even better, let me just find friends who like fitness and let's work out together, right? You do this all the time. I do this too. And so what he did was he was like, all right, we're going to wake up at five or six in the morning um, in New York and they go somewhere and do a different fitness related activity it doesn't matter how fit you are although the pictures that they share like everybody's got like a six pack everyone's um, jacked and then it's called like the program and it's basically like kind of networking kind of friends hanging out and kind of fitness all at once uh but instead of being kind of each of them actually that's the wrong way to say it, it's it's like the 100 percent of each of those <laughs> because when you work out with somebody it's like the new york banker style yeah, exactly. of doing and this. so they get up they do something different every day and um and he like would pay for it. So he's like, all right, if we're doing this activity, like money is not going to be the object that stops somebody from doing this. So I'll, I'll just cover it for our whole group and we'll just go do whatever the heck activity we want to do. And so the guy's in great shape. He's like, oh, I love it. Cause I get to hang out with like a bunch of like really interesting, motivated, like kind of 20 or 30 year olds that are like pushing me to a, be more fit and like, don't be the old man. But also like, these are really talented, ambitious people who are, who see the world differently than me. Right. And so I thought this is just a fantastic idea. And um, Bev told me a friend of a friend of a friend of his was was doing it. And uh, I was invited when I was in New York, but for some reason the scheduling didn't work out. I couldn't go. But yeah, they well, get up early. Well, that's the beauty of it, they right? Up, so they... how do you prevent this from being just the moochers show up who just want you know just the, the networking and all that? You make it at six a.m. Uh, and you make the fitness thing kind of hard. <laughs> that's the fil filter that will self-select for the type of person you want to be around. Or this kind of thing. I just hate working out at 6 a.m. I hate working. Dude, I, work I thought out you'd be evening. all about it because, um, like, you know, the harder the better for you. I, yeah, like, I would go. But, like, the problem with my my issue with working out at 6 a.m. means I've got to wake up at, like, yeah. 520, which means I've got to go, go to bed at, like, 9. And if I have to go to bed at 9, I'm in bed at 9. And I'm so anxious thing, saying to myself, if I don't go to sleep now, like, I'm not going to be able to wake up. But I get so anxious about waking up early that it makes right. it not fun. Totally, for me. totally. You know and what the, I mean? The, 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 I, I, I hate I, that. I, I don't work out early. I work out as a midday break every day. So I, I work out I like at that too. 3 p.m. every day. And uh, and actually, I, I pretty much stop working at that point. And then I come back and I start working again at like 11 p.m. or midnight. And so I don't have to wake up early. And I have a bunch of energy when I do that. But the the the, the takeaway for this for me, um, the voice in my head when I heard this, I go. Oh yeah, I forgot. Sean, build your cult. And um, I think that's just like the takeaway. I think that's you got to build your cult. It's like, do the things you want to do. Uh, open them up so that others can do them with you. Do them in a way that's like slightly hard and everybody's making a bit of a, a everyone's stretching themselves in some way because that's the sacrifice and the buy-in, the blood oath that you want in your cult. And like, just fucking build your cult. Be around the type of person you want to be around. Dude, this is this is why I exactly. bought a farm. you're building your cult. That's a great example. I was doing it. The, I'm the like, general I, assembly I, guy. What did he do? Uh, Daybreaker. Yeah, Daybreaker. It was like a 5 a.m. party with no alcohol. Build your cult, drugs. right? Like, what do I want? I want to start my day. And yeah, people I want to start my day with a bunch it. of energy, dance, blah, blah blah. But I don't want alcohol and music. I don't like nightclubs. So I'm gonna bring, I'm gonna build my own cult. That's awesome. Uh, all right. Did you have anything else you wanted to do, or so, should we wrap it? Uh, I can wrap it. <laughs> sounds good. Good episode.